So hello everyone and welcome to uh, this new session on multi-arm bandit problems, which is part of the course on machine learning for data analysis. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. So our speaker for today is Javier, who is a, an early stage researcher and PhD fellow at the University of Torino in Italy. Uh, before joining this uh, early stage researcher position, he uh, did a bachelor's uh, degree in mathematics and computer science engineering and a master's degree in statistical computational information uh, processing uh, from Polytechnic University in Madrid. And his current research <laughs> focuses on data-driven supports to understanding of complex dynamical pro physical problems such as epidemics. And um, Javier is a very gentle person. He was kind enough to agree for this talk. I'm uh, really happy to have you uh, here, Javier. And uh, thank you for your time and over to you, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Guayit, for this presentation. Uh, hope it will be interesting for all of you. And yeah, as Wajit said, uh, this presentation, today's presentation are in the multi arm bandit problem, which is a machine learning problem. Um, yeah, machine learning is a very huge field, and today I'll focus in in one of these in one of these problems because I found it is kind of interesting. It is um, very easy to understand, but it can be also very complex depending on the, the version you have. And I'm also using it on my research, so I think it's very convenient to, to talk about it. Uh, I think at the end of the talk, we'll, sorry. Ah, we'll have uh, time for questions or comments, so in case you have one, we can, we can discuss later. So, okay, first of all, I'm going to talk about the, the index of, of context, of the contents I, we are going to discuss today. First of all, I'll give a very, very brief introduction to machine learning for all of you to know, or in case there are any of you who are not very into machine learning, it is only to, to talk about what it is and different types of machine learning algorithms. After that, we are going to talk about the multi arm bandit problem, which is the problem in which we are focusing today. There are, the, as we'll see, there, there are different strategies to solve the multi arm bandit problem, different versions. So, we are going to discuss all of this uh, in a very easy way with examples, with uh, a few, few equations. I think it will be very interesting. After that, uh, we'll talk about the uh, different applications of the multi arm bandit problem because as we'll discuss later it's a problem which can be applied to any kind of fields so you can apply it to epidemics in my case but also you can apply it uh, to select uh, your studies to select a restaurant in a city so in all of these situations in which you have to make decisions from one option and other option you will have a, a multi arm bandit problem behind and last, we are going to, to talk about the conclusions of the of the this talk. So first of all, a, a brief introduction to machine learning. So I took this this definition from Wikipedia, and here it says, okay, machine learning it is an umbrella term for all the solving problems for which development of algorithms by human programmers could be cost prohibitive. So what does it mean? It means that in machine learning, all of the machine learning algorithms are algorithms in which you don't tell the machine what to do. So you don't tell you have to do this, then do this, then do this to solve this problem. You give it some, uh, some definition, you give it some clues, and after that, the machine by itself is the one who develops an algorithm and try to focus on the things that are more important to solve the problem. So in this case, as we can see here, instead of uh, solve problem by itself, we help machine to discover their own algorithms. So we don't need to explicitly tell them what to do. 
So, for example, neural networks are a kind of a machine learning, are a machine learning kind of algorithms. And in neural networks, you do, for example, a neural network for classification of images in case you want to classify if there is a cat or there is a dog in a, in a picture, you don't tell the algorithm, okay, you, you have to focus on the eyes of the, of the animal or you have to focus on the background or you have to focus on the color. No, you create an algorithm and after that, the neural network trains itself to discover the your algorithm to try to classify if there is a cat or if there is a dog in a, in a picture. So this is the, the important the important clue about this type of machine learning algorithms it is that okay they learn by themselves and this is interesting because this way you can solve a lot of problems and any kind of problems that otherwise will be impossible to solve then uh, here i put um, a little uh, picture for all of you who are who have all of these terms in in your heads, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, data science, to have a quick view on how they how they relate to each other. So, for example, in our case, machine learning, that is what we are discussing today, it's inside a larger field, which is called artificial intelligence. Then we have in this part, data science. Data science is the science who, who works with data and it's kind of relating with machine learning, but there are also parts of data science we have we are not relating with machine learning, so it, it is not the same thing. Today, as I said, we are focusing here on machine learning. And inside machine learning, here you can see the different types of machine learning algorithms that we can find. So there are three main groups of machine learning algorithms. First one is the unsupervised learning, second supervised learning, and the third one is the reinforcement learning. And I'm going to give a very brief definition about them. The first one, the supervised learning, uh, focus on discovering patterns in static data. For example, as here, as you see in the picture, you can do clustering of data, which is discovering patterns with the data you have. In case of supervised learning, is learning from explicit training data. So here, for example, you can do classification of different groups. You have a data set of data and you want to classify, or maybe you want to do a regression. So inside of this group, there are several types of algorithms. And then here in this part, we have the reinforcement learning that maybe is the, the less uh, new. And it focuses on the thing that it discovers the, be the best option from trial and error with life examples. So here we start to see the difference between those two groups and this third group. And as you see here, you can see here, the main difference is that in these two kind of algorithms, the unsupervised learning and the supervised learning, the full data set is available at once. So inside here, there will be the, there are the, for example, the neural networks. And as all of you know, to train a neural network, you need the full data set to give a lot of data for the neural network to train. Also to do clustering, you have the, you need data, to do a regression for all of them, you have a full data set, you need a full data set. And the difference with reinforcement learning is that in reinforcement learning, you don't need a full data set. Well, it is not that you don't need a full data set, it is that you don't have a full data set available. That's why uh, for, my, for reinforcement learning algorithms, you require repeated and incremental updates. So as time goes, you get more knowledge about the environment, you get more knowledge about your problem, and repeating and time after time, you start to know and start to solve the problem. But it is in an incremental way. You go time by time, and as different uh, with these two other algorithms in which you have the data set at first and then you train the algorithm. So I wanted to mention that because this is the key point of informal learning algorithms. I'm focusing here because the multi armadic problem, as we are going to see now, is inside the, re the informal learning group. So uh, now after this little presentation, little background, we are going to focus on the multi armadic problem. Uh, well, as I just said, 
the multi bandit problem is inside the reinforcement learning group of machine learning. And okay, let's go to see quickly how reinforcement learning algorithms work. Okay, in reinforcement learning algorithms, you have an agent and then you have the environment. And what happens? The environment, the agent can take observations from the environment. So the environment changes, it is not static, it is changing time by time. As time goes, you have more information and you have to take into account all of those observations. Then the agent, based on those observations, takes actions. Uh, based on what he's seen, he can take an action, what to do. And based on that action, the environment gives a reward to the agent. So the agent, based on this reward, can change uh, or can learn what to do next. So next time, for example, if the reward is negative, next time that uh, the agent sees the same observation, maybe he will change its decision because last time he did this, thing, the reward was bad. And if he receives a good reward, for example, then he can continue doing the same. But the key point here is that time after time, he is doing everything the same, all timestamps are is doing the same. That's why he's able to learn about the, the environment and to learn and how to solve the problem. This is the key point. So with the multi bandit problem, um, works like this. First of all, we are going to talk about how or why this problem is called multi bandit problem. And first of all, we we need to talk about one arm one arm bandit one arm bandits and well uh, I well I didn't knew what it was but I discovered that uh, long time ago the casino slot machines these kind of machines uh, were called one arm bandit and why because one arm because they have here one one lever and bandit because people who play with them tend to lose money. So that's why they were called one-armed bandits. And now in our problem, we have multi-armed bandits. So what could they be? So multi-armed bandits problem are based on the multi-armed bandit, which is a one-armed bandit, but with a lot of levers. So in this case here in the picture, we have four different levers. And... The key point here is that each of the levers has a different payout, but you, as the player, don't know which one is higher. So in this multi arm bandit, what you want to do is, okay, I'm going to pull the lever which has the maximum payout, payout so that I get the maximum reward possible. But you don't know mm, which one is higher. So you have to try, you have to pull all of them several times to try to guess which is the high end and to try to exploit your information. So the key question here is, okay, you have to try different levers, but for how long? So you don't have infinite money. So each time you try a lever, you are losing money. So you have to decide, you have to take, put a balance between how long to try different um, levers and when to stop and go with the one who has given you the, the highest payout. So it is what it says here. If you keep pulling the low payout lever, you lose rewards, so you leave more rewards. But you won't know which lever is good until you try a sufficient number of times. So here we start to see a balance between exploration and exploitation. And this is a, a trade-off, this is a dilemma which is very, very well known for all the researchers because it is a really active uh, research field called exploration versus exploitation. As in the multi arm bandits, we have to decide when to stop exploring or until which point to stop exploring and when to exploit because uh, remember that we want to maximize our rewards. And as we'll see, all of the problems, all of the applications we are we are going to see we are going to see now are based in this exploration versus exploitation dilemma. Okay, now uh, 
after the this all of this this stuff we are going to to start with the multi arm bandit problem itself uh, to to explain it i'm i'm based on one example of restaurants so as i said a multi arm bandit problem can be applied to any kind of fields you can apply to several fields and i picked this a very simple example because i think it is easy to see how the different strategies of multi arm bandit works and all of you will understand it. I took this example from a very interesting YouTube channel, uh, which is about machine learning, data science, and all of this kind of stuff. And I found it very interesting. So that's why I'm, I'm showing it here. And OK, taking account that we are uh, in a particular example. Later, we are going to see different kind of applications. And we can, same things we are going to discuss here can be applied to any kind of fields so which is our particular example the example of restaurants so imagine you you are moving to a new town to a new little city for 300 days you are going to spend 300 days on a new city in which there are only three different restaurants uh, and each of the nights you you are spending there you have to have dinner in one of the restaurants but you don't have any information about any of them. So there is no Google Maps reviews, there is nothing. So you, for knowing which one is the best for you, you only have to, or you only can to try to go dinner and there. And based on your dinner, you derive a level of happiness. So based on the restaurant itself, based on the waiter, based on the cook, based on the food, you derive a, a level of happiness. And what you want to do is try to maximize your total happiness on these 300 days you are going to spend in the, in the city. So here, it is very easy to see that we are again in, a, in this exploration versus exploitation dilemma because okay you have no information so you have to explore different options you have to go several times you don't know how many times to these different restaurants but after one moment you will you will need to exploit one of these restaurants because uh, there's been a moment in which you have enough information so you know which restaurant is the better for you which one derives the most happiness for you and you want to exploit that option because you want to maximize your general happiness over these 300 days. And, okay, this is the problem we have. Now, what can we do? What can we do to solve this problem, to solve this dilemma? To What can we do for, to maximize our happiness? So here we can find several strategies. First of all, we are going to discuss two naive strategies. Uh, which are uh, very, very easy to understand. And let's see how, how they work. If I, are they useful or, or what? So first of all, uh, first of all, we need to say that each of these restaurants has a happiness distribution, a happiness distribution, which is unknown to you. So we don't know this distribution under here. And in this case, there are normal distributions with uh, different means and standard deviations. First one is a restaurant which gives you, by mean, 10 points of happiness with standard deviations of five. The second one gives you, by, by mean, eight points of happiness with standard deviation of four. And the third one, standard, well, uh, mean five of happiness with a standard deviation 2.5. So this is by mean, and you don't know these distributions. So, okay, exploration and exploitation in this problem. So the exploration part, you want to go to the restaurant enough time to understand which one you like the best. So you want to go several times to the restaurants because going one time maybe is not enough. And the exploitation part is one, you have a pretty good idea about which restaurant makes you the happier. You want to continue going to the restaurant to maximize your happiness. So. The first two naive strategies, first of one, first of the two, we can find the explore only strategy. If you remember the explore versus exploring versus exploiting dilemma, there are two different parts. So we can split it 
and we can go with one of the strategies. First one is the explore only strategy. And how does it work? So in the explore only strategy, you are going to spend your entire 300 days visiting a random restaurant every night. So you will going to go 100 days to a restaurant, 100 days to another restaurant, and 100 days to a different restaurant. And okay, so if we take into account the means, the mean happiness from all these restaurants, in this case, you are going to go 100 days to the first restaurant, which has a 10 minute happiness, 100 days to the second one, which has 8 minute happiness, and 100 days to the third one, which has a 5 minute happiness, giving you a total of 2,300 mean of happiness. Okay, we have a value, but we don't know if it's good, if it's bad, if we can do better. So to try to compare the multi arm bandit, uh, different strategies of the multi arm bandit problem, we need to talk about the regret. And what is the regret? So the regret is the difference between the average happiness from your strategy and the maximum happiness that you could possibly achieve if you knew all the information beforehand. So if we knew this distribution I saw before, it is possible to derive a maximum reward because you know the information, you know which restaurant gives you the best uh, happiness by me, so you can fix a maximum reward. And you have to do this, this difference between your the average happiness from your strategy and the maximum you could achieve. So it is very easy to see that knowing these three distributions, if we knew this distribution will go for restaurant one because by me it is the one who which gives you the maximum the maximum level of happiness and the standard deviation are not much different. So knowing that the maximum happiness that we could achieve is going all the days, 300 days to this restaurant, to the first restaurant because it is the better for us. So we can say that the maximum happiness we can achieve is this 300 days multiplied by uh, the mean level of happiness, 3000 level of happiness. So the regret in our case, uh, regret is called with this letter, with this letter row, would be 300, 3000 minus 2300. It gives us a uh, 700 uh, regret. And well, is it good? Can we do better? So <laughs> I can say that this level, the explore only strategy is not the best. So maybe we can achieve better results with other different strategies. So we can move on to the other part of the, the naive strategies, which is the exploit only strategy. Previously, we've seen the explore only, and now we are focusing on the exploit only, exploit only the other part of the trade-off. So how does it work? In this strategy, the first three days, we'll visit one day each of the restaurants. And then for the rest of the days, we'll pick the one that gave us the best meal. In this case, we are, we are spending 300 days in the city. So we have th three days for going one day to each of the restaurants and 297 days to exploit in the first one. But mm, this exploit only strategy has a very, very easy to see problem. And it is, okay, you are going only one day to each of the restaurants at first. So you might get a bad meal at the best restaurants because if you remember, the happiness you derive are based on distributions. So maybe one day, in one day, you don't have enough information. So for example, let's say that we go the first day to the first restaurant and we get an average happiness of six, and the second day to the second restaurant, and we get an average happiness of seven, and the third day to the third restaurant, and we get a happiness of six. So these values are possible and are compatible with our distributions, because as you remember, although the mean for the first restaurant is 10, it is possible to have a six of happiness because that's a standard deviation of five and same for this restaurant. So in this case, after these three days, which is the maximum happiness you've got? So would be restaurant one. 
or sorry, restaurant two, although it is not the best restaurant, because remember, the best restaurant for us is the first one, which has the highest mean. But in this case, only going one day to each of the restaurants mm, is not a very precise mission. So in this case, after these three days, we are going to go all the 297 days we have left to the second restaurant, although it's not the best. So uh, what would be our reward? In, in this case, our reward would be six plus seven plus six from the first three days plus 297 days left multiplied by uh, eight, it should be an eight, which is the, the average the average mean of the, the second restaurant. So in, in this case, as you see here, we have a fewer reward than in the exploration uh, only strategy. And this is because we have chosen not the, not the best restaurant, but it, it is same possible to pick the third restaurant depending on the means. So here we are seeing the, the main problem of this strategy, which is, okay, one day it is not enough information. If you see here, uh, we are in this case in which we are stuck at a suboptimal arm. So in this case, the optimal arm would be choosing the first restaurant, but we are stuck in a suboptimal arm because, okay, the algorithm says, let's go to the exploit only, because of the exploit only strategy, let's go to this one, which gave us the best, uh, the best happiness, and let's go with that. But maybe this is, this is not the best, the best option. But with one day, you have not enough information. So doing simulations, because this is only one case, but doing simulations of different scenarios in which you have different values for this restaurant for the first three days, we can get an average regret of 330, which is better than the explore only strategy, but uh, it is not the optimal value and it is kind of far from the optimal value. So at this point, we need to, to explore different, different options in case we found uh, in case we found uh, the strategies. So after these two knife strategies, we can go with the epsilon greedy strategy, which is based on a balance between exploration <laughs> and exploitation. So what do we do in this epsilon greedy strategy? We have to set a particular value for epsilon. A. It is normally around this 10% because it shows the number of days that you are going to do exploration and the rest of the day, so Y minus the epsilon would be exploitation days. So in this case, we have 300 days. So with an epsilon of 10%, we will have 30 days for exploration and 270 days for exploitation. Okay, and how does it work? So any of the days based on this probability of 10% probability. So you will set if we are in an exploration day or in an exploitation day. If we are in an exploration day, we pick any of the three restaurants randomly and we go to that restaurant to try and to see if uh, things are changed or we derive uh, different values for before. And the rest of the 270 days, we go for exploitation. So in these days, we check which is the mean of the happiness we have for each of the three restaurants, we pick the highest and we go to that restaurant to exploit the highest mean restaurant. In this case, uh, so this is not the perfect solution for sure, because as we see here, if this would be the distribution, the happiness distribution for two different restaurants, in this case, if we use the exploit only strategy, the one we've seen previously, okay, with the exploit only strategy, we go one day to this one and one day to this one, we get values. And for sure, this value will be higher than this value because distribution are not mixed. So it is impossible to have a lower value from this, from this restaurant than the restaurant. So in the exploit only, we will get one value for him, one value for this, and we are going to exploit this one. So we will get the highest happiness level. 
because but it is because of the distribution. And in this case, with the epsilon greedy, for sure, we'll spend 30 days exploring. So although we know this is the best restaurant, we have to explore because we've set an epsilon and we've set a number of days that we have to do exploration. And maybe it is not the best thing to do if you know which is the best restaurant. But using this epsilon greedy strategy, it is what it is. So what I'm telling you with this is that there is not a best strategy. There is not a strategy to go and that works for everything because depending on data, depending on the number of the time you have, you maybe one of the strategies is better for you than the other. Because in our case, in our case, this is the, the distribution for the free restaurant. So in our case, restaurants are mixed, distribution are mixed. So it is possible to have a bad meal in the best restaurant. You, it is possible to have a better meal in the, in the worst restaurant than in the best restaurant. So for example, in our case, maybe it's convenient to use this kind of epsilon greedy strategies better than the exploit only. But as I'm seeing, it depends on the on the data and not depends on the environment, so many things. So if running the this code, uh, this epsilon greedy code, we get an average reward of 2,900 with a regret of around 100, which is better than exploration only and also better than exploitation only. But uh, mention again that this is for our particular problem with three restaurants, 300 days. So here, Epsilon Greedy performs better, but maybe with other kind of problems, which are not the restaurant problem, maybe it is better to use a different strategy. Uh, a good thing about the Epsilon Greedy strategy is that uh, it has uh, a zero regret. And what's that, what does this mean? That at, as time goes, this regret, this row, the regret, tends to zero as time going to, goes to infinity. So what does it mean? If, in, if instead of spending 300 days in the city, you are going to live there forever, so finally the regret will tend to zero because as time goes, you will have enough information to know and you will have enough information to decide which restaurant is the better. So you are going to explore uh, you are going to exploit this restaurant as much as possible. So as time goes, you are going to achieve a regret of zero, which is kind of good for these strategies. But again, it depends on data and it depends on the number of days. Maybe if you are not spending uh, a infinite number of days, maybe you prefer going with other different strategies. Okay, and after that, after the epsilon greedy, uh, I'm going to talk about another strategy because as we see the epsilon greedy strategy is not perfect and it has also a different problem which I'm, I haven't mentioned and is okay if you imagine we have two different restaurants and we have derived one that has mean three and the other one has mean 2.9 these two means are very close one to the other and with the epsilon greedy strategy, in the exploitation day, you are going to go with the biggest mean, so with the highest mean. So in this case, we are going with the to the restaurant, which means three, but maybe this restaurant is not the best. And maybe the one who has mean 2.9 has mean 2.9 because you have only go once. So we are not taking into account how many times we have go to the restaurants because maybe if going more days to this restaurant achieves a bigger, a highest mean. So we have to take this into account and that's why we can develop uh, other type of strategies which are called the upper confidence bound strategies. The upper confidence bound strategies are a family of different strategies all based on confidence uh, bounds. And in our case, I'm going to talk about one of them, which is called UCB1, the number one. But take into account that you can find different different numbers of the this kind of strategies based on, on a slightly changes on the formula. So how does it work? In this case, 
at each time t, we have to pick a restaurant R such that we maximize this formula here. And what is this formula? In this first term on the formula, we have the mean happiness derived from restaurant R, which is the same we had before. So before we were only taking into account this part, which is the mean happiness we derived from the restaurant, and it is how Epsilon Greedy works. But now we are adding this second term uh, in which we give the benefit of the doubt to restaurants that we haven't visited a lot yet. This the second term is based on the opt-ins inequality. And what it uh, allows is to have more, uh, have more, more probability to visit to restaurants that haven't visited much yet. So in this case, in the denominator, we have the, this uh, N of R, which is the number of time we visited a restaurant R so far. And here in the in the in this other part, we only to point that we are using the natural logarithm because uh, we want the the increases get smaller over time. So as time goes over, as we have more information and we don't have to pay so much attention to to the exploration phase. So this is also good because at first we have no information. We have no visits, we have nothing. So we want to explore as much as possible to have information. But one time goes, as you have information, you don't want to put so much effort in that part. Maybe you want to start to, to start exploiting that. And as you see here, we have the number of times we've visited a restaurant so far in the denominator. So that if this value is low, so if we haven't go to a restaurant so much, this value will be low and this will be high because this is low. But if we go to a restaurant so many times, in this case, this value will be very high and this other quantity will be low. So that we are adding a plus of uh, confidence to restaurant that we haven't got so much yet. This is very, this is very convenient and why? Because maybe this restaurant has the highest mean, but it is because we've go so many times. So in this case, maybe it's better to go to a different restaurant in which we have not so much confidence because we have only go once or we have only go twice. And it is important to explore these options, although the mean is lower than, than other restaurants. And that's the point of the this algorithm, and that, that's why it, this strategy is also good because, as different as the other strategies we've seen, the epsilon greedy and the other two, this takes into account the number of times we've go to the restaurant, which is also convenient. And here, as before, we see again the exploration versus exploitation uh, trade-off because this part will be the exploitation part in which we take into account the mean of the restaurants, the mean of the different arm, and we're going to the higher the better, so higher mean, uh, means a uh, better, uh, better possibility to go. And in this part, we are seeing the exploration part in which we give more values and higher highest values to restaurants we haven't visited so much. So here in the formula itself, we can find the exploration versus exploitation dilemma. And last thing is to mention that this kind of UCB, UCB family strategies, are the most widely used solution methods for the multi armative problem nowadays. So uh, depending on the problem, but we can see that this kind of methods outperforms the, the other one we've seen. And to show that, I have here a table uh, which I which I found uh, well, which I derived from a code uh, you can find on on GitHub. And here in the table they compare the four strategies we've seen: the exploration, exploitation only, epsilon greedy with epsilon of ten percent, and the UCB one strategies for different scenarios. So in this case, this uh, variable n shows the number of restaurants we have in this scenario. So here we can have three restaurants as in our example, but they try these algorithms also with 10 restaurants and with a hundred restaurants to see how they behave 
to, uh, with different number of restaurants. And they also vary the standard deviation. So it can be high or it can be low. I'm not showing the, the exact numbers, but you have to take into account that as we see before, if the standard deviation is low, maybe the, the, the distribution of the restaurant don't mix with, with each other, don't overlap. So maybe in this case, the one of the strategies perform better than in cases in which the standard deviation is high. And if the standard deviation is high, we have, we have a lot of, lot of overlappings between the distribution of the restaurants. So maybe in that case, we prefer to use uh, different strategies. Uh, also to mention that the means of the distribution, these are all a uh, normal distribution. The means uh, are different for each of the restaurants. And the values we can find in the table represent the regret divided by the optimal solution. So the lower, the better. In this case, with a lower regret means a uh, highest performance of the, the strategy. And to comment this data, uh, you can see here that we are focusing, for example, for three restaurants with a high uh, standard deviation, so with a high overlapping of the distribution, the algorithm that outperforms the best is the UCB1, uh, which makes sense with the with what we discussed uh, before. And with a low standard deviation, it is better to use the exploitation-only algorithm. And why? This is because we've seen later, if the standard deviation is low, we are very unlikely to get errors in the first visit of the restaurant. So maybe after one visit, you have enough information to exploit that restaurant, and maybe you are lucky and you continue exploiting that, that restaurant. Uh, with 10 restaurants, it's more or less the same. So with a high standard deviation, the best algorithm is UCB1. But in this case, UCB1 is also the best for the for uh, low standard deviation very very near from the exploitation only with only 100 percent different but uh, here we can show that you can be wrong with the exploitation only because as number of restaurants increases you are more likely to get wrong in one of the visits to the restaurant so maybe in this case, most of the time you are not exploiting the best restaurant and it is better to, to use other kind of algorithms in which exploration has more importance. And finally, with the with 100 restaurants, we get a surprisingly result and it is that exploitation only works better for the two cases. So it outperforms UCB1 and all the rest for a higher, higher standard deviation and lower standard deviation. And this can be due because with we are in the case we have 300 days to spend in the city. So having 100 restaurants, you have to spend the first 100 days going each day to one of the restaurants. So you only have 200 days in this case to do exploration and exploitation. So by me, having only 200, 200 days left, you will go by mean two more days to each of the restaurants, which is not very convenient. It's maybe you don't have enough days to do the exploration, exploitation phase. And in this case, you spend the first 100 days going to the first 100 restaurants, and after that, you decide. And maybe, as we don't have enough number of days, this algorithm is performing better. I think that if we increase the number of restaurants, or oh, sorry, if we increase the number of days we spend in the city to thousands, for example, UCB1 might perform better because um, I think here these results are because the number of the number of days compared to the number of restaurants. So that's why I'm saying that all of these strategies, maybe UCB1 can seem better than these three, but depending on all kind of different factors that uh, the distributions that you don't know, the number of arms, in this case restaurants, the number of days, you know, so the quantity of time you have, depending on all of those variables, you can go with a with a algorithm or with another algorithm. Okay. So after that, I'm going to 
very, very quick to explain more strategies we can find because we explain three, four of them, but we can have more variation and different strategies. So if you remember, we, we had uh, the Epsilon greedy strategy and a very similar to that, we can find the Epsilon first strategy and the big difference uh, between those of them is that in the Epsilon first strategy, in this strategy, first of all, you do pure exploration and after that you switch to pure exploitation. In the Epsilon greedy one, you mix those of them and depending on a probability, you add a exploration days and an exploitation days mixing. And here, first you only explore and then you exploit. Mm, again, uh, this strategy can be better for any kind of problems and the other can be better for other problems. You can also have Epsilon decreasing because another of the other of the problems of the epsilon greedy strategy is that you have a fixed value for epsilon and maybe as time passes you have more information and you won't you want to decrease the number of exploration days because as time goes on you have more information about how is what what is the best time to pull so in this case the uh, epsilon decrease is, is based on favor exploration initially but then favor exploitation and to do that you have only the only thing you have to do is define epsilon as a function of the number of steps. So in this case, depending on the number of steps, you define a value for epsilon. So at first it's high and then it's low. This is the difference. And we can have also an epsilon greedy strategy, but with softmax exploration. So uh, in epsilon greedy, the exploration day, you go to any of the three restaurants. In our example, for example, we went to any of the restaurants randomly with the same la, with the same pro, uh, probability to go to any of them but maybe we want to go to restaurants based on a probability based on the mean of the restaurants so maybe we want to go to any of the restaurants so we have a probability to go to any of the restaurants but maybe we want to go with high probability to the restaurant with the highest mean because maybe we want to explore but we want to explore with high probability the best restaurants. So these are different strategies for you to, to know. Also, uh, we've seen UCB and we can also have Bayesian UCB uh, that incorporates uh, prior information about the distributions. So in this case, in regular UCB, we have no prior information, but in this case, we can have prior information about the restaurants to perform better. And there are another kind of algorithms like, like I'm putting here the XP3 algorithm, which is more similar to machine learning algorithms because it sets weights to all the arms of the multi-arm bandit problem. And then it starts to change those weights based on the observation. So this is more like uh, how neural networks, for example, work in which you have, uh, for neural network, you have weights for each of the connections and everything, and you start to uh, update the, these weights. So in this case, it's kind of similar. Also here, I, I put the this picture to mention that, again, we don't have a optimal strategy because if you hear in this picture, you can see that in green, the UCB is the strategy that performs the better at the end, but until this time, epsilon greedy is doing better. So depending on the number of days you have, maybe you want to go with the epsilon greedy strategy because the epsilon greedy strategy uh, maybe exploits more at the beginning and the, the UCB is more conservative at the beginning and it does more exploration. And after that, maybe after a number of days, maybe it's better. But if you don't have so much time, maybe you want to go with other strategies. This is again to show that, that difference. And after that, I wanted to mention here that we are with multi arm bandit problems, but there are also non-stationary bandit problems. So in our case, we are doing an important assumption, and it is that we are working always during all the process with the same distribution. But for example, in our case, in our restaurant problem, what happens if the cook at one of the restaurant changes? So it changes things. So in this case, we have to pay more attention to most recent samples. So most recent samples will be more important. 
in this case, we need to use a constant factor, for example, to try to solve this kind of non-stationary bandit problems in which distributions are changing. So you cannot take into account only all the historical information because maybe it has been a change or maybe distribution has changed. So this is also for you to know that there are different kind of uh, bandit problems. Here you can find also gradient or other kind of of bandit problems. So for example, gradient problems, which, uh, which are based on the, the gradient descent uh, algorithm. We can have dueling bandits in which we have uh, two different bandits competing. We can have cluster bandits. Here there are a lot of types of bandit problems which are being actively researched now. So this is also for you to know that there is a high high quantity of research in, in this area. For contextual bandit problems, for example, in which you can have you can have observations, you can have information from the environment, and you take your decision based on the mean of the restaurants, for example, in our case, but also on the environment, maybe you you have more information from one of your colleagues and you want to use this information to take a decision. So possibilities are infinite in the in this area. And it is also very interesting because these are very different one from each other and there are different approaches and all of them are very, very interesting. Okay, so after showing some of the different strategies we can have in the multi arm bandit problem. We are going to see some of the applications of the multi arm bandit problem. Now we've seen that we can apply this kind of algorithm to a restaurant decision problem, but we have more important and more useful applications for the multi arm bandit problem. For example, first of all, I'm going to talk about my research because I'm using the multi arm bandit problem in my research. So in my case, what I'm doing in my research is I want to estimate a complex function which has a large number of parameters. So sampling in that space is very costly. And my goal is to approximate the shape of the function using as few samples as possible. So as sampling there is costly, I want to use the few numbers of samples as possible, but I want to know the shape of the function. So I have a limited budget of mm, samplings. So I cannot sample all over the space. I want to focus because I don't have an infinite number of samples and I want to decide very, very well where to, to sample. Because for example, here I put a, a very easy function, but as you see here, it has different parts. So it has this flat part, it has this difficult part. So maybe I want to focus a bit here to see that this part is flat, a bit here that see that this part is difficult, but that's it. I don't want to sample all around the space because it's very costly to sample there. So this is more or less my approximation to the problem. Uh, what I've done is a three-step algorithm. So I can do different types of sample. I can propose different types of samples. I can sample based on the gradient of the function to see changes maybe it is useful. I also can do, I also can sample based on the interpolation of the error when decomposing the space, and I can also sample based on the gradient of that error. So I have three different strategies here, and maybe these strategies focus on different parts of the function. Maybe the gradient focus on flat parts, maybe the interpolation of the error uh, focus on difficult parts, I don't know. And I want to sample as few as possible, but what strategy should I use each of the runs of my algorithms? So here we can find a very, very well uh, problem for the multi arm bandit to solve because I have a limited number of samples and I want to decide to which of the strategies give the samples each of the runs. So here it's a very clear use for the multi arm bandit. And to do that, I only, we only need to find an objective error function that allow, allows us to determine how good are the samples proposed by of the strategy. And as in all the multi arm bandit problem, it is important to, for example, also in my case, it is important to explore because as I said, different strategies can focus on different areas of the function, but it is also important to exploit. When I know that this strategy is the best 
for what I want to estimate for my function, I want to exploit this strategy to don't waste samples in regions that I know how they are. So in my case, this is important to use, for example, this multi arm bandit. But this is my particular my particular problem. And we can find multi arm bandit problems in other kinds of different fields. For example, in clinical trials to see uh, which pills to are the better for a particular patient in network routing, online advertising, also what ads are the better for uh, these users. So reading this, uh, I read that in the Washington Post, they were using a multi arm bandit to, to decide which ad to show to the, to the users. Uh, also in game designing, because in game designing, you want to incorporate new features and you want to take uh, to taste if those features are good for the users. So you have there an exploration part in which you want to innovate, you want to create more functionality. And then if it works, then you want to exploit them. So here you can also find a dilemma. Also in video recommendation in YouTube, it could be useful or in any kind of recommendation, the multi arm bandit is also useful. Okay, so after that, and to finish, I'm going to talk about my conclusions. And very, very quick, I put here four conclusions. First of all, is that the multi arm body problem is an active area of research. You have seen how many different kind of strategies, how many different application fields it has. So it is very, very, very researched uh, nowadays. Second one, uh, it can be applied to many fields in the industry, as we've just seen. Third, the algorithms so, are so simple and so powerful that everybody can use them, even small companies, because they don't require high computational resources. And number four, and to end, is that apart from the multi arm bandit problem, if you start mixing it with Bayesian probability and with other techniques, you can enter into a new kind of fields like the Thompson sample, which has the same base as the multi arm bandit problem, but it adds different kind of variation stuff. So this kind of field can mix with uh, other kinds of the statistics and computer science. And yeah, that's it. So thank you so much. I don't know if you have any questions or any comments. I'll be happy to, to answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Javier. That was a very interesting and useful uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would just uh, maybe we would just stop recording and then you can take questions.